everybody here at Redemption. Good to have you here in person and online. My name is Dave. I'm one of the pastors here, and I am so glad that you decided to worship with us today. Well, uh, last week was my birthday week. When you're a kid, you have a birthday. When you're my age, you have a birthday week. You, you squeeze as much as you can out of it. And so we did some different things to celebrate. I went to the city one night with my wife, and we had a nice dinner together and without the kids. And uh, we uh, also had my favorite birthday cake, carrot cake. Uh, my, my family uh, brought it to our dining room, and you know, there's the candle on it, and they set it in front of me. And before I was ready to blow out the candle, one of my kids said, make a wish. And this question came to my mind in that moment that was this. What if I were to make a wish uh, now at 49 years old? What wish would I make? Uh, what wish would you make? If you could wish for anything and that wish would come true, what wish would you wish for? Uh, maybe you'd say, I'd like a lot of money. Well, that could be a good wish. You could help a lot of people. You could be generous. Uh, it, it could actually contribute to freeing up some of your, your time and make things a little bit more convenient for you. It could create some options in your life. Uh, so it's not a bad wish, but we also know that, it's, uh, that money can't bring happiness, right? Uh, maybe you'd say, I'd wish for a husband or for a wife. I, I wish to be married. How many of you here today wish that you would be married? Raise your hand up for me. Let me let me see it. Okay, good. Uh, and, you know, it might be that today God has brought you here to help answer that wish. He might have a little divine appointment uh, for you later after the service. I don't know. But that's not a bad wish, so it's a pretty good wish. Um, some others of you might be wishing uh, for beauty or for health or for happiness or fame. Uh, there are uh, others of you that might want to wish uh, for more wishes, to kind of maximize your wish. But you know what? We, we've all seen Aladdin, right? Um, and more wishes isn't necessarily better, uh, right? Uh, and then there's others of us that might wish for world peace. But what I want to submit to you today is that, um, <clears throat> is that many people, what many people really want in life, and a lot of times people don't really know that they want or they need it, is peace. It's real peace in their lives, a peace that the world would not understand. It's a peace from God. It's a divine peace, a peace that only God can give. And I, I don't know if you know this or not, but you can be very wealthy, have money in the bank, but have no peace in your heart. You can be very successful on the outside, but it'd be incredibly empty on the inside, right? Right? You can be married, but not have peace in your home, and maybe for some of you, you haven't had peace in your home for a really long time. I would argue that what a lot of people want, and they don't even know that they want it or need it, is peace that comes from God. But what so many of us have is not peace, right? We actually have the opposite. We have tension, don't we? Uh, a lot of us we're afraid or we're anxious. Uh, when you think about your relationships and your family and your friends, what do you want? You want peace, right? You want harmony. You want understanding. Uh, but so often we have the opposite. We have misunderstandings, don't we? We have disagreements. We have hurt feelings. We have bitterness. We have unforgiveness. And I would submit to you today that what so many people want, what they really want, is peace in their life. T today we're going to be beginning our series uh, on Advent, and Advent simply is a Latin word that means coming. And so this season we want to expectantly wait for and prepare to celebrate Christmas. Uh, you know, uh, we celebrate Jesus' coming and we uh, are mindful of his soon return. And so we want to open our hearts for Jesus to meet us afresh this season, to pull back from all the busyness, to pull back from all the shopping, and for Jesus to meet us afresh. And so for the next few weeks, we're going to be looking at different passages from Old Testament prophets, and we're going to see what God was wanting to speak to his people during those times, and in turn speak to us today. 
So this perspective we might call uh, B.C. before Christmas or, or uh, before Christ, as we uh, tend, tend to know it. And so standing on the other side of B.C. history during these next few weeks, we're going to discover that Jesus fulfilled the messianic prophecies that were spoken about him. So we're going to start off today by talking about the prophet Micah. Now, the word prophet might sound a little strange to some of you. Uh, for example, uh, some of you might be thinking of an image somewhat like what you see on the screen behind me today when you hear the word prophet. <laughs> uh, you know, uh, simply prophet is a messenger of God who has a message from God. That really is what uh, a prophet is. And uh, so the prophet is usually reminding God's people of the blessings and the curses that God has given long ago, right? So he reminds people of the blessings that will come when they follow God and they obey his word, they obey his will. And he reminds God's people of the curses that will come if they decide to turn away from God and to disobey God. And and so you would think that in the nation of Israel, when a prophet comes on the scene, that the king would actually listen to the prophets. In fact, what happens in most of the instances in the Old Testament is that the king does just the opposite. He doesn't listen to the prophet or his message. And you know, one of the things that we want to ask ourselves is when that happens, do we think that God is okay with it, that the king's don't listen to his prophet, they don't listen to the prophet's words, well, no, it's, it's not okay with God. Um, do we think that God just looked the other way and did nothing? No, uh, there were consequences to the kings turning away from God and not listening to the prophets. Uh, now, God was patient with the kings, he was patient with his people, um, but eventually consequences would Come, to start with, after the reign of King Solomon, uh, God split the nation of Israel in two. Uh, the northern part of the nation was conquered by the Assyrians, and the southern part of the nation, Judah, was actually eventually, uh, it actually eventually fell to the Babylonians. So in the midst of all this chaos, right, the northern part of the nation has fallen to the Assyrians. Babylon is at the door, ready to invade the southern part of the nation, Micah comes on the scene. The world around him is full of violence and injustice. Uh, war in the Middle East was not something that was as sanitary as it is today. Uh, I don't think of America when you think of a country going to war. This was awful violence and injustice that would happen toward the people of God by the Assyrians. The, the people had turned away from God. God's people had turned away from him. And because uh, of that, the northern Part of the nation, like we mentioned, had uh, fallen, and now Judah is under threat from Babylon. But in the midst of this, God gives Micah a message that his people needed to hear, a message promising peace. And so we pick it up in Micah chapter 5, verse, verses 1 and 2. It says, Marshal your troops now, city of troops, for a siege is laid against us. They will strike Israel's ruler on the cheek with a rod. But you, Bethlehem, Ephrata, though you are small among the clans of Judah, out of you will come for me one who will be ruler over Israel. The world is a mess. The country is under threat. Yet God says from the smallest clan in Judah, from the most in in insignificant part of Judah, I will raise up someone significant. Someone who will eventually rule. And as it says in the last part of verse 2, whose origins are from old, from ancient times. And then we continue in verses three, and five, 3 to 5. Therefore, Israel will be abandoned until the time when she who is in labor bears a son. And the rest of his brothers return to join the Israelites. He will stand and shepherd his flock in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God, and they will live securely. For then his greatness will reach to the ends of the earth, and he will be our peace. Despite all the chaos raging around God's people, Micah writes of hope for a better future. There is hope for someone to come and someone who will be their peace. Now, the Hebrew word for peace here is shalom. Say it with me this morning. Shalom. Yeah, good. Uh, and I want to really, um, really hit this home with you today. I really want you to get this meaning of shalom because it's a very important part of what we're going to talk about over these next 
uh, few minutes. The, the shalom of God is way more than merely the absence of conflict, but it's a completeness, it's a wholeness, it's a fullness in every sense of the word, in every area of life. It's peace in every way. It's complete and perfect peace. It's peace with God. In other words, there's never an internal sense of fear or dread. Where do I stand with God? And have I done something to think that he wouldn't love me? Have I gone too far? Where do I stand with God? And have I done something to think that he wouldn't love me? It, have I gone too far? Is my shame too great? It's peace with God. It's peace with other people. Never a worry about where we stand with other people or why we are bitter at each other. It's also peace with yourself. That dark spot in your past that you're so ashamed of, that thing that you did this past week that you didn't really want to do. It's peace with yourself where you can say, I'm okay and I'm good with God. It's peace with your circumstances, even when your circumstances aren't what you would hope them to be. It's complete, whole peace from God. Now, I want to be clear. Peace doesn't mean that you won't have trouble in this world. Uh, Jesus was really, really clear about this. And I'm sorry to disappoint you, but that's, this is what Jesus says in John 16, chapter 16, verse 33 of John. He said, in this world, you will have trouble. This is what Jesus says. In this world, you will have trouble. It doesn't mean that you won't have problems, right? It doesn't mean that nothing's ever going to break. It doesn't mean that the kids are never going to argue in the car on the way to church. It doesn't mean your the spouse is never going to be annoying. It doesn't mean that your boss is... Um, is, is always going to be super sweet. Uh, your boss will probably get on your nerves from time to time. Peace doesn't mean that you're never going to have a difficult time. We need to understand that peace, true peace, isn't just merely found in the absence of problems. It's found in a person. It's not just found in the absence of problems. It's found in a person. In the presence of the one who Micah prophesied about so long ago, it's found in the person of peace, in Jesus. And this bringer of peace will come from Bethlehem, from a small town that nobody thinks about or nobody cares about, it's from something insignificant. God will bring the one of significance. And so during this Christmas season, we celebrate him, amen? When, when the angels come to announce Jesus' birth, what do they say? They say, glory to God in the highest and peace on earth. Somebody say, glory to God. <laughs> glory to God in the highest and peace on earth. Jesus is born. He is the fulfillment of this prophecy that Micah, 700 years earlier, had prophesied about to bring this peace that was to come. And yet the people of God in this day, in, in Jesus' day, had a hard time believing that this peace had come. A conflict was a very real part of their everyday life, with Rome ruling over them. Jesus wasn't coming to bring an earthly kingdom. Jesus wasn't coming to overthrow the hand of the oppressor of Rome, uh, even though that they would have loved for that to happen. So where was this promise of peace for the people of God? You know, we could say the same thing today as the people of God. Where is this peace? Where is this promise of peace? You might be thinking today, my marriage sucks right now. Where is peace in that? You might be thinking, my body is wrecked right now. Where is peace in that? I'm trying to hold things together financially, and it's Christmas, and the bills are stacking. Where is peace in that? I've got a child who's addicted to drugs. Where is peace in that? So how, how do we experience, truly experience this peace? Not just talk about the promise of it, but in a, in a very practical way, experience this peace that God gives us. Well, I think there are four specific areas or, or directions where the peace of Jesus impacts our lives. The first direction is up. Let's call this one positional peace. This is the peace that Je Jesus brings between us and God. The Apostle Paul, who wrote most of the New Testament and himself experienced peace in a very dramatic way, 
explains the kind of peace to the church that he founded in Rome. It says in Romans chapter 5, verses 1 to 2, Therefore, since we have been made right in God's sight by faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ has brought into the place of undeserved privilege, where we now stand. And we confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing God's glory. Because of Jesus, the record of our wrongs has been wiped clean. You might wonder, have my wrongs been too many for God to forgive? Well, let me encourage you that you are made right. If you trusted in Christ as your Lord and Savior, you have been made right with God by his grace, his undeserved favor. And Jesus, who's the Son of God, he never, ever sinned. He was perfectly obedient. And when you put your faith and trust in Jesus, God sees you through the perfect life of Christ. Okay? He sees you as if you've never sinned. Justified means that. It's just as if you've never sinned. And you can look forward to one day being in the presence of a holy God. It's peace with God that you did not earn. It's peace filled with radical grace that Jesus came to bring. And Paul says with this positional peace that we are also looking forward to one day being in God's presence. So that's the first direction, up. The good news is that there's more good news. <laughs> there's more goodness of God that comes. Jesus brings more. In the second direction, uh, the second direction we were talking about is internal. It's in. It's in. Um, internal peace. And despite all the challenges and struggles that life throws at us, Jesus gives us peace inside of us. And here's how John, one of Jesus' closest friends and disciples, records Jesus' words. John in chapter 14 Verse 27 says, I am leaving you with a gift, peace of mind and heart, and the peace I give you is a gift the world cannot give. So don't be troubled or afraid. You catch that? He's giving us a different kind of peace that doesn't only have eternal implications, but that changes the states of our hearts in the here and now. So that's the second direction. That's the in. The third direction that this uh, piece of Jesus impacts is a cross, and I'm going to call this one the social piece. Uh, and I want to spend a little time here today because I think this is very important and relevant for us today. So this piece that we're talking about, this social piece, is about us. It's about the church. It's about the body of Christ. And Jesus invites us as a body to lean into um, this understanding of peace. We're to look different. Listen. We are to look different than the arguing and the fighting and the name-calling that's happening all around us. We're to look different. And here's how the, Paul, the Apostle Paul explained it in Colossians chapter 3, verse 15. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you were called to peace. And be thankful. Because we're part of the same body, living at peace with one another is essential. In fact, the, the point that Paul is making here is subtle, but it's extremely important. The word rule that he uses here is the same word used to describe a sort of ancient umpire in a sporting event, kind of like the Olympics. Uh, he's saying when life gets chaotic, when that person says or does the thing that pushes you to the edge, let the peace of Christ give you uh, the ability to, to respond in a way that honors him. Let the peace of Christ give you, uh, that is given to you, help you to, to call the shots in whatever situation you find yourself in. So to illustrate this idea, I want to show you a picture of the manager of the Yankees. He's uh, just heard about a bad call that the umpire had made, well, he, what he thinks is a bad call at home plate that the umpire made in this particular game against the Rays, and he just goes unhinged on this umpire. Nothing ends up changing, right? The rules that the umpire uh, set, are they don't change. Uh, no matter how much you get in an umpire's face, you know, no matter how much you yell and scream, the rule that the umpire made is not going to change. And, you know, I think that uh, Boone's reaction to the umpire's call is actually a pretty great metaphor for how we sometimes feel toward one another. Uh, don't we sometimes, at least internally, feel like we're gonna, we want to just come unhinged with others around us? Uh, but you know what? The umpire's ruling stands. 
And the same is true for us spiritually. When we're inclined to lash out, to counterpunch, or to be spiritually out of con- to spiral out of control, Paul invites us to let the peace of Christ be the thing that ultimately calls the shots in our life. When you're coming unglued, let the peace of Christ change your mood. When you're coming unglued, let the peace of Christ change your mood. So how do we do this? Well, it's easier said than done. Let me give you some practical steps. Uh, So if you're taking notes this morning, uh, now is a good time to jot these things down. First, we deal with conflict early. First, we deal with conflict early. The book of Proverbs says, picking a fight is like leaking water from a crack in a dam. So walk away from an argument before an outburst. If we are to let the peace of Christ rule in this place, in our church family, we can't ignore our conflicts or allow our disagreements to fester. We need to bring them out of the open and work together at resolving them and giving each other the benefit of the doubt. We do. Or as the Apostle Paul put it, do not let the sun go down while you were still angry. I I think that's good advice for us all, don't you? So first, deal with conflict early. Second, practice restraint. Practice restraint. James, the brother of Jesus, shares these powerful words. My dear brothers and sisters, take note of this. Everyone should be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. We tend to do the opposite. We're quick to speak and slow to listen, right? Uh, basically, uh, we do what the manager Boone did with the umpire. We're, we're quick to lash out. We're quick to speak. I want you to think back to a recent argument. How quick were you to listen? I think that is a good determiner of, of, of how easy this is to apply in our lives. It's not easy, but it's, it's, it's what God is saying is going to bring us peace, and, and it's a way to pursue peace. If we're going to let the peace of Christ rule in this place, we're going to need to find a better way than how the world around us is dealing with conflict. So uh, James points us to this way, to be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to become angry. And lastly, we want to commit for the long haul. We want to commit to the long haul. Here's how Peter, another of Jesus' disciples, who also had struggles of his own, talks about it. He says, they must turn from evil and do good. They must seek peace and pursue it. So he understands that peace is not just going to magically happen. He understands that it's something together that we have to actively pursue as a community of faith. In other words, it's a marathon to do this, not a sprint. If we're going to let the peace of Christ rule in this place, we have to be constantly pursuing a peace that Jesus came to bring. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, then you're probably not as close to other people here at Redemption as you should be. Because listen, when we get close to people, there's conflict. There is. When we get close to people, there's more potential for conflict as well. Uh, Now, let's look at the final direction. Jesus came to bring us upward peace, uh, positional peace, up, internal peace, in, uh, social peace, across, and finally, missional peace, out, okay? And this is the peace that we are entrusted to bring to the world, wherever our world may be. The purpose of having this peace that surpasses understanding isn't to hoard it for ourselves, but to extend it to other people in the world around us, right? To be agents of peace wherever we go, amen? And so here's how Jesus says it in Matthew chapter 5, verse 7. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. That's the invitation. Not merely peacekeepers, people that don't want to rock the boat or ruffle feathers, but peacemakers. That's what the world so desperately needs. Scholar and theologian N.T. Wright puts it like this, people who believe in the resurrection and God making a whole new world in which everything will be set right at last are unstoppably motivated to work for that new world in the present. As followers of Jesus, we're called to be peacemakers, people who look to carry the shalom of God into every place and to every person until everyone follows this person of peace, this Jesus. Well, what now? 
That's the question. What now? Well, first, I, I want to encourage you to prayerfully consider doing something that our church has the opportunity to do. We, as the church here at Redemption, have the opportunity to do to bring the shalom of God to our world. And it's participating in our Christmas offering. Later in the service, Pastor Jeremy is going to share more details about this. But to give you a little glimpse, we get the opportunity to share this shalom, this peace of God, through a number of different things through the Christmas offering. First, we get to help Afghan refugee families be resettled here in Westchester County. Second, uh, we get to feed people who struggle to make ends meet. And the third thing that we'll get to do through this offering is that we are going to be able to continue to reach people through this beautiful space that God has blessed us with this past year. Now, in addition to these opportunities with the Christmas offering, uh, we also have the opportunity to carry this peace in the little things that we do each and every day. Author Henry Nouwen writes, God's peace challenges us to anticipate what it promises. Every time we forgive our neighbor, every time we make a child smile, every time we show compassion to a suffering person, Every time we arrange a bouquet of flowers, offer care to, fa to animals, prevent pollution, create beauty in our homes and gardens, and work for peace and justice among all peoples and nations, we are making the vision come true. Thousands of years ago, God spoke through a prophet named Micah that someone would come from the town of Bethlehem who would be our peace. And this Christmas, we celebrate this person of peace, this Jesus who came. God wants you to remember that this Christmas, he wants you to remember this Christmas, that it's not peace, true peace is not just found in the absence of conflict. It's not just found in the absence of problems. It's found in a person. No matter what you're going through, maybe for you it's a relationship that ended, no matter what you're up against, maybe it's a toxic work environment that continues to get worse and worse or that bully at school that never leaves you alone. Maybe it's a conflict with a family member. Whatever chaos you are in the middle of, remember that this true peace comes into the midst of your circumstances just like Jesus came into the midst of this broken and dark world. Jesus' gift of peace is anything nothing like what the world can offer. It's shalom, it's wholeness, it's fullness, it's completeness in every sense of the word. And may we be people who experience his peace and who bring his peace into every corner of our lives. Let's pray. Lord, we come before you and we are amazed at the peace that you give us through Jesus Christ. And as we think this week and pray this week about what this peace actually looks like in our lives, I pray that we would be able to just step away from the busyness of this season, to step away from some of the shopping, to step away from some of the activity and get with you and say, God, I want more peace in my life. Help me get more of that peace. Lord, we thank you that the reality is that we already have the peace. Now help us to live that peace out, to pursue that peace in our daily lives in all the ways that we talked about today. It's in your son Jesus' name, this person of peace, that we pray. Amen.